for about the first two weeks of January each year. We have to think sympathetically about all the clerks who work at Sam's Club and Walmart, and Costco and Dick's Sporting Goods. Do you know what they're doing? Restocking their shelves with all the bad presents people got for Christmas back in December. You open up the package, and of course the person giving it is right there in the room, three feet away, intently watching the expression on your face. And when you see it, however, you can hardly believe your eyes. The thing is terrible. It's wrong. It doesn't fit. It's ugly. You already have ten of them. What does the subject of bad Christmas gifts have to do with 1 Corinthians chapter 12? A lot, maybe especially as we realize that the passage deals specifically with the topic of spiritual gifts. God's gifts to every man and woman, boy and girl, who enters into his worldwide organization called the Christian faith, the body of Christ. I want to emphasize, first of all, that they are indeed gifts bestowed on each and every one of us and they come from God himself. Verse 11, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one, just as he determines. Then at the end of chapter, the chapter in verses 27, 28, Paul says it again, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Now the key phrase there, of course, is God has appointed. God has selected the various gifts and distributed them according to his own wisdom. But what does that mean? We often get bad Christmas presents from very well-meaning people, people who love us like our own mothers. Why then are the presents so wrong? Often it happens because we're simply lacking in wisdom. People don't know that I've graduated from a 36 waistline to a 38, so the pants they get me don't fit. They don't know I look bad in purple and don't have a single shirt to match. Unaware of what CDs I already have and own, they buy the one I already have. But God, who has infinite wisdom and knows everything about me as well as what his perfect vision and plan is for my life and ministry, will never make those kinds of mistakes. You'll never look up from the wrapping paper on God's Christmas morning gift and say to God, uh, I, uh, I hate to say, but this really doesn't fit. You gave me the wrong thing. Actually, you know, maybe I should amend that observation a bit because we're not wise, because our knowledge, even of ourselves, is so limited. We might open up God's gift to us and decide that it doesn't fit. What he's given us, well, it doesn't seem right to us, or we don't feel comfortable with it. But is it possible that God, in his wisdom, could give us a spiritual gift that takes us some time to accept and fully use? It's sometimes an act of faith to trust in the giver of the gifts. Our Heavenly Father has an infinite knowledge of us, an infinite love too, and bases his gift to you as a member of his church on those two factors. His gifts aren't arbitrary. God doesn't sit in his throne with a kind of Parker Brothers spinner, handling out generically wrapped gifts like trinkets. As we've discovered already, He's also not the kind of gift giver who buys the exact same Christmas present for everyone. No. All through chapter 12, Paul teaches us that God personally chooses the gifts himself. No one spends more time Christmas shopping than he does. 
Now let me add two more points right here. First of all, if God gives perfect gifts that he himself has chosen, then we should never fear that some gifts are better than others or that we deserve special attention because of our talents. Neither should we feel inferior if we think we've received a lesser gift, a less glamorous portfolio of divine presence. Should we ever be jealous of others' gifts? No. Why should we be when God is the one who chose ours? One respected commentary says on verse 4, the disposition of the gifts by God is to be accepted gratefully and due recognition given to the one who dispenses these powers and not to the recipient as being in any way superior to his fellows. My getting a particular gift means that God is good, not me. But this Bible truth runs contrary to our human instincts. It's very human to think of some gifts as higher than others. We think of Joel Osteen, who pastored that 16,800 seat mega church in Texas, and seen by several million viewers each weekend. Then there's the fictional Eleanor Rigby, the character in the old Beatles song, who quietly picks up the rice in the church where the wedding has been. Hmm. What a contrast in gifts. Osteen had the gifts of preaching, of telegenic media presence, of administration, uh, while Miss Rigby had the unnoticed gift of service. Which one is greater? Well, right away we assume that Joel Osteen would get the blue ribbon, but that's not heaven's thinking. And it shouldn't be ours either. You see, the body of Christ has no room for jealousy, for rankings. Now here's a second point. The church belongs to God. It's His, and He defines its boundaries. His Spirit leads its operations and completely directs the dispersal of gifts within it. He's the one who's equipped His church for service today. The church's success is up to God. Its performance is also His doing and His responsibility. In the book, The Jesus I Never Knew, Philip Yancey wonders aloud why the church messes up so much. Why are we so slow to learn? Why are there so many denominations? Why isn't God's work done yet? I see no point in tallying up a balance sheet to weigh the church's failures against its successes. The final word will come from God's own judgment. The first few chapters of Revelation show how realistically God views the church, and yet elsewhere the New Testament makes clear that God takes delight in us. We are peculiar treasures, a pleasing aroma, gifts that He delights in. I cannot fathom such statements, Yancey confesses. I merely accept them on faith. God alone knows what pleases God. So when you mutter to yourself over dinner, why can't our pastor do a better job? Why are his sermons so confusing? Remember that God has given the gifts. For some reason, or reasons that you might not yet comprehend, he does know what he's doing. Despite our Christmas morning confusion, he has given out the right gifts. Yancey adds a bit more on the same page of his book. Jesus takes full responsibility for the constituent parts of his body. You did not choose me, but I chose you, he told his disciples. And these were the very scalawags who so exasperated him and would soon desert him at his hour of greatest need. Friend, if we don't understand the current direction of the church, we trust God.
When some gift seems wrong, we trust God. Or if, despite what 1 Corinthians 12 says, others belittle your abilities and put you down on a low rung on the ladder, you just keep on trusting in God and thanking Him for the gift He thought was good for you. Even if your gift seems right or wrong, it often takes time and an act of faith in order to make that gift work. The men or women who've received the gift of preaching may not present an eloquent first sermon, but as they keep at it, keep on digging and keep on studying and researching and adding some good perspiration to what God has provided, the preaching gets better and the gift shines ever brighter for the world to see. Thank <laughs> you.